today. Uh, any new members? Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Hi, I'm Norman Jarrett. I'm not a geologist. I'm a chemist, a uh, microbiologist by education. By business, I'm a working in the supplement industry. My friend Dave here is a uh, he's a real geologist. <laughs> and then I come and join up with you and go hiking and skiing. So that's why I joined this to learn more about uh, the geology of Utah. Great. Well, any, any uh, guests today? Uh, so, just as a reminder, uh, we have recycling in back. Uh, so, please do recycle your cans. Um, Peter Nielsen has announced his publication. Peter, do you want to talk on that? Yeah. Our upcoming presentation. We just did our call for papers for our Utah geosites. Uh, this publication is going to be geared towards uh, earth science teachers, geology that most geologists don't stop at an outcrop throughout the state of Utah. So it's going to be, uh, I think, a fun project to write. We expect you to go out there and take pictures of the site and uh, do a good write up on it, and uh, eight pages long. Eight to ten pages as well. So uh, we expect this to be a fun project to write on. We would like between 30 and 50 sites from the state of Utah. So everybody think about writing something up, uh, considering what to write. Uh, we've got a list of sites. We'd also like to know what else everybody thinks would be a good place to go out and visit. So uh, it'll be fun. So everybody sign up for it. Thanks, Peter. It's going to be a really great site. Or to so I definitely recommend contributing. It'll, it'll be a very valuable resource. Uh, okay. Let's see, any announcements? Do I have any announcements they'd like to make? Uh, anybody know when the next uh, AEG meeting is? Is there going to be another one? Soon? September is the next one. Uh, just as a note, Roger Bond was nice enough to reserve our uh, picnic site this year, same place. Uh, it's August, August 11th is the date that we set. So that's where we'll, we'll be doing the annual UGA. And as usual, uh, it'll likely be barbecue and all are welcome. Okay, uh, barring any other announcements, I will give Emily the floor to introduce our speaker. Right. They were very pleased to have Bill Carson come down from the Great Town Logan to give us some talk. Joel is currently serving as the department head of the geology department at USU. He has his master's from Northern Arizona University, a PhD in geomorphology from the University of New Mexico. Um, his research interests are vast, but primarily focused on the western interior of the United States. Um, and he uses a lot of OSL and plays a lot of uplift and a very great along the Colorado Plateau. Um, he also helped establish the luminescence lab at USU, which is fairly unique and really well run. So we're excited to have him come and talk to us. So everyone, welcome to Joel. Yeah, yeah. It was just here when we got here. So. Okay. Yeah, usually we don't have one. Well, this is uh, this is uh, a real treat uh, to get to do this. It's always a huge pleasure to, to talk about science to uh, to a broader audience of people who know what they're talking about still and are interested in Utah geology. Um, <coughs> Let's see here. I've got. Uh, oh, and I want to thank him. Um, so uh, my list of co-authors here include um, a couple of students who recently uh, 
Yeah. Should be, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, James and Mike are students who literally just in the last days or weeks have graduated from USU and finished up their work and research. And uh, and uh, one of the, one of the advantages of me getting to do this talk today is that uh, what I'm going to show you is all really very new results um, that we're still finishing up these projects and they're part of the students' research and they're not published yet. And so if I look surprised at what comes up on the slide, it's because I haven't given this talk before and I've stolen slides from these students um, for this presentation. Now, of course, uh, Tammy um, is the professor who's in charge of our luminescence dating lab at USU. So she plays a key role in this. And Alan um, is a cosmogenic nuclide scientist at Florence Livermore who's provided geochronology. And I want to recognize Sherm Young, who's actually in the audience today. Um, sitting back there, Sherm inspired a good chunk of this work and supported it in many ways. And, and uh, like maybe many of you, he's a, a citizen geoscientist um, and not a study professor. Um, so I want to thank Sherm for, for being responsible for a good chunk of this. Um, okay. You have it. Yeah. Way too much. Of course, he's probably. Every week, every month, every month. <laughs> we could do that. Still not working. We can just do. I can just do it if you want. Could be. Okay, I'm pretty sure I just turned it off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll just do it if you want. All right. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay so uh, this talk is going to have uh, two parts. And first, uh, I do want to provide some context and. Little hybrid, a little bit of cherry pick background about the landscape evolution of the Colorado Plateau, especially work in the last 15 years um, about uh, the patterns of erosion in the Colorado Plateau, and then um, and then the results that I want to show you um, in the middle part of the talk are from Jackson Lincoln, which is in this photograph, here. Um, and and this is a ring on an abandoned bedrock meander of the Colorado River, just immediately downstream of Moab, Utah. Um, so maybe many of you have seen it. There's a really beautiful view of this from across the river at Potash. Um, you look into this big abandoned bedrock. Um, and then also, um, the last part of the talk will be uh, from James Mouth's master's thesis um, studying in and around Moab and mapping a big chunk of Spanish Valley um, right outside of Moab. Uh, I want to point out really quick uh, that the new results uh, come from studies of river territory. So in this abandoned wind time, you have this great situation where the river, after it cut off this meander that's now over here, it preserves old terraces and bed gravels of the Colorado River that are now sheltered from the erosion of the river itself. So there's a very nice record of river gravels, and if you can date these river gravels, you can learn about when this cut off meander actually occurred, and then uh, we can also get incision rates since that time. Um, and so that's the highlight of uh, the research design. Uh, okay. Um, a little bit of background for a couple slides on the patterns of landscape evolution. So this is Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, and the four corners um, that um, are in the center of the Colorado Plateau through the graphic topics outlined there. And of course, the, the main, main drainage system is the Colorado River going through Grand Canyon here. Um, and then here's the confluence I want to highlight of the Green River and the Colorado River. And uh, this is from a paper um, a few years ago where, as I compiled the work that we've done at USU and other well constrained records of river incision from terraces, like I was just describing, um, a pattern emerges where the erosion rates across the plateau, um, the Colorado Plateau, are not very uniform. And in fact, maybe a, a surprise to some people. The rates at which the river is eroding the Grand Canyon in the Pleistocene, because these are all Pleistocene rates, kind of ongoing geologic rates of erosion, um, is, is significantly slower than some very rapid erosion rates in southeastern Utah. So if you go to a landscape like Canyonlands National Park or Haines Hill or the Henry Mountain, that's a landscape that, from all the measurements we have, is eroding three or four times faster than Grand Canyon. And uh, so we call this the bullseye 
of incision in the central part of my intestine. And towards the edges, both upstream and down in the Grand Canyon area, these rates of incision and erosion are actually less. So this is the bullseye of, of erosion. So we know that the Canyonland country of southeast of Utah is among the fastest eroding places in North America. Uh, okay. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so this 450 in Henry Mountains, this is 450 meters per million years. So half a kilometer per million years. Um, well, that would make it almost half a meter per thousand years of vertical erosion in the land. Okay, so um, also very recently, um, and I'm also setting the paper that's maybe not yet out in the American Journal of Science, there's uh, an important PhD thesis done in the University of Arizona by Kenya Murray. And, uh, and she has worked extensively in southeastern Utah, <coughs> um, having seen that there's this evidence of very rapid erosion using thermal chronology. The thermal chronology reaches back a few million years and dates the cooling or exclamation of rocks, another way of getting that erosion over somewhat longer. And uh, just to highlight, um, going right here in the middle of the bullseye, um, her main result is that, uh, yes, it kind of confirms this ongoing rapid erosion um, and points out that much of the erosional estimation of southeast of Utah are all accomplished in the Pliocene and especially the Pleistocene. Um, the majority of the erosion, like kilometers of rock, have been removed in the Pacific in southeastern U.S. This is a plot, um, it's actually a bunch of computer model results, but it, it shows the results of her analysis um, of, uh, of these minerals. And that is that through time and millions of years, as you approach it, this is the temperature history of the rocks that she sampled right around the head of the mountain. And uh, you can see that one thing that dates here is the date of the Olympian intrusion of the Hennings. They have a nice new date on that. And then the rocks sort of stood around, buried by a couple kilometers, um, for all of the mid late Cenozoic. Until right here, right here, the rocks cool rapidly to the surface, um, according to her data. And if you look at the tick marks there, the erosion of a couple kilometers of rock around the Henrys, in her results, is literally the last two million years. Um, so very rapid, recent erosion in this part of the world older erosion of Grand Canyon and slower than um, So that's uh, an overall <coughs> pattern. Um, and then uh, another thing that, that we've done lots of studies on is how the erosion patterns might relate to the strength of rocks that rivers are encountering um, and that we see exposed on cliffs. So of course, if a rock is harder in geomorphology, we might presume that it, it erodes more slowly. And that's uh, definitely true. Um, if you collect data across the Colorado Plateau, you can make a plot like this that compares the decision rates of these different localities where we've measured them to the strength, the actual mechanical strength measured in the laboratory, the tensile strength of the rocks. And there's this nice negative relationship where um, very strong rocks tend to uh, be associated with relatively slow erosion and weak rocks. And the problem is that, or the, the, the pattern here, right, is that the the weak sedimentary rocks, the metamorphic section is exposed in the central color pattern, whereas uh, in the Grand Canyon region, it's got more of these really hard rocks that there's a uh, little more storm. Okay. All right, so um, this erosion that we detect today and we're, and we're looking at patterns in, it's ultimately related to the Colorado River getting its act together and becoming integrated out of the interior west to join the basin range and get to the, to the Gulf of California. Um, and that happened five or six million years ago. And, uh, um, and there's been a huge amount of work, especially in the Grand Canyon region, and a lot of debate about exactly when did that happen, and how did that, or what portion of the Grand Canyon was cut back to that. Um, and so we get this wave of incision that is driving all of this, but the patterns within that erosion um, are more complicated than could be explained just by, oh, the erosion started six million years ago. And, uh, and as it proceeded. You have this sort of bullseye pattern. And then in fact, in, in drainages, especially tributaries of Colorado River, um, there are lots of mix zones, which are interpreted um, or, or hypothetically relate to what we call transient incision. And that is the idea that um, at base level falls, incision works its way upstream to a river system. 
and um, moves over time. Right? So a wave of incision will move over time upstream. I think the next thing that will pop up is a little classic diagram. So there have been a couple of studies by uh, a really great geomorphologist and student, uh, Thomas Whitmore, in the Palo Plateau, um, studying this sort of long profile of rivers and the mix zones of those rivers and what they might mean in terms of the history of waves of erosion um, going through the region. And so here's a simple diagram from a classic paper in geomorphology that, that shows as you as you follow a river um, from upstream to high elevation and you trace its channel down through to its mouth, um, it has a characteristic equilibrium profile. And if you drop base level because of tectonics or because the Colorado River drains off of a plateau and you drop base level and start erosion, that creates a midpoint. And that midpoint propagates upstream. And this paper was about um, the mass behind what governs that, how you can test um, that upstream propagation of a midpoint. Um, so what I want to point out is, is we're going to look at a lot of long profiles. And I want to make sure that you have this picture in your mind. That if you look at a drainage system and you can see a, an inflection or a midpoint in its long profile, those usually separate an upper part of the drainage that's buffered from erosion. It hasn't seen that base level fall yet. It hasn't made it upstream that far yet. Um, from a lower part of the drainage that's better adjusted to this new base level. And all of the action is right in here, right? If this propagates upstream, this is where you can get very rapid um, short term rates of erosion in a landscape in association with that midpoint moving through the system. That cartoon makes sense? <laughs> All right, that's the next step. Okay, so I want to show you just one slide, um, and then we'll be done in the background, from a master's thesis that Phil published of a student of mine in USU. And she did partly some of this long profile analysis right in the Needles Fault Zone in the Needles District of Canyon Land, which is a neat landscape, and it shows uh, an example of the evidence for this wave of erosion going through the system. All right, so next slide. Here's a, a classical diagram, um, and you know, when I was working on this, I had my huge monitor on my desk. And I kind of thought this was going to be bigger. It might be hard to see for some of these. So here's an old uh, uh, hand-drawn diagram from the 70s from the Four Corners Geological Society guidebook. And this is Cataract Canyon in the Colorado River. It's supposed to be an aerial view looking down on the Needles Fault Zone and all of these horses and gravel. Um, and so I hope that a lot of you are familiar with this part of the world. Um, and uh, the story here, um, especially championed by Peter Huntsman and others, is that as the Colorado River cut this canyon, it eventually penetrated uh, the Paradox Formation in the subsurface. Um, and, and, and it created this space whereby these little upper plate rocks could be sliding along the salt laterally, collapsing into the Cataract Canyon. Uh, so the Needles Fault Zone of Canyon Land National Park is literally a huge scale lateral spread and toppling of a landscape into Cataract Canyon as it's sliding on salt in the subsurface. So we've had that picture for, for quite a while, and it raises this cool idea about how the incision of this canyon is what would have started this fault system, is this is sliding into the hole. And also, Peter Huntoon championed the notion that the gala fuse coming up along the Colorado River had created structural anticlines and stuff, and that the unloading of this canyon has allowed for sort of diaphoric couplings to solve in places in Southeast Asia. Um, this is uh, a paper uh, published on the same area. So here's the confluence of the Green River and the Colorado River, and it goes through Cataract Canyon. Um, and so this is the Needles District of Canyon Land National Park. And this was published in 2007. This is an INSAR geodetic study that was measuring sort of real time deformation in this part of Canyon West National Park. And the color coding here relates to vertical motion detected in the geodetic study. So all the red here in this fault, this monthly fault zone, all the red are places that they actually could measure rate of subsidence um, as that was collapsing and laterally spreading and going into the cataract. So it's cool. This is an area that's rapidly actively performing, and we can actually measure it with satellite data. All right, so the next slide. Here's the one slide stolen from a student's face thesis. 
Um, that is a really complicated one, but this is looking at um, three drainages. So there's blue, lighter blue, and red. And these are, this is the long profile of gypsum wash on the south end of the diagram. And it's showing that all of these drainages that cross their fault zone and head to the cataract canyon, they all have two main midpoints in them. It's really systematic pattern where um, gypsum canyon way up high has got a midpoint here. And the theater makes a standstill, and then another sort of equilibrium looking reach, and then a big midpoint that just plunges into cataract canyon and meets the Colorado River. Um, and uh, what you can do is you can take this and assume that this reach has been buffered and has not yet seen the base level fault in the cutting of cataract canyon. And you can numerically project that equilibrium profile out, and you can estimate um, where in space. The Colorado River crossing was when the decision of the canyon began. And one of the neat things is that all of the drainages in this part of the world all project to the same point, the same elevation at the rim of the original cataract canyon. But some of them, this is what this is showing, some of them we have to actually restore the subsidence from this withdrawal of salt that is measured here. So remember, this uh, INSAR study was showing that this area of the world is actively subsiding. Um, and in fact, the long profile of these rivers actually allows us to say, well, yeah, we can actually tell that this terrain here has dropped a total of 200 meters um, since this system began to form. So we can actually start to put numbers on how much subsidence vertically is happening because of this salt tectonic activity around the can. And the next thing that will pop up is that as these all project, um, Cataract Canyon is 600 meters deep. And uh, very quickly, if you go, uh, um, sorry, if you recall that bullseye incision, we have well constrained incision rates just upstream of here and just downstream of here. If you use those incision rates, um, you realize that all of Cataract Canyon could easily be cut in the place. Cataract Canyon is one and a half or one million years old. That's all the time it takes to cut all of Cataract Canyon. Mm -hmm. And it has been cut recently. So Cataract Canyon is a quaternary canyon. It is a paternary feature. In fact, it's sort of mid lake place to see. And that's kind of cool to me. I spent a lot of time studying Grand Canyon. And the big picture of Grand Canyon is that if you go see Grand Canyon, Grand Canyon is a Pliocene thing. Right? It was cut mostly in the Pliocene. And so as we see this erosion hitting the central plateau of more recent ones, canyons like Cataract Canyon are not Pliocene or place to see. All right. Now, um, here's a last concept, and then we'll give you some new results. From this cool so I've been talking about um, this sort of propagating midpoints or propagating waterfalls and systems. And, uh, and when you look at a long profile of a river, you can hypothesize that that mix zone is representing a wave of incision. But how do you actually know? How do you actually test that that's what's going on? That there's literally a moving wave of incision through the system. Um, and so the great thing we can do is we look at a river's history and study its incision rates through time. There's a couple of cool signatures that we can look for. And to my knowledge, uh, people have not really done these sort of studies before. And so I'm about to show you a place where we can kind of capture one of these waves of incision in the act, in the geologic record, for the first time. So um, first thing is, if, if you're at a single locality, so this, this is a long profile river with a mix down there um, at time zero. And if this is moving upstream as a wave of incision, and if we go back in time and use river terraces, for example, to go back in time, we would say, well, the mix zone would have been downstream a little farther. And then downstream farther, we have even older terraces. And so over geologic time, coming to today, we would have a record um, of this moving wave of incision. Do you see what this simple cartoon is showing? Um, so if you were at a single point, like right here, and you just had a record at a single place along the terrace that you stay, you would see that at some point in the past, there was very rapid incision. And then as that weak point passed, the incision would slow down uh, more recently. And there are other places where you have slow incision in the past that has ramped up because it's just downstream of where the mix zone is now. And then there are places upstream of all this where it's just slow. And it's not changing for the buffer because it doesn't see this wave of incision. All right, so the next slide. So here's the idea that yeah, 
we're going to go into three different locations along the Colorado River and see if we see these paths. See if we see incision rates change um, at a uh, single locality at a time, or if you go laterally upstream, if incision rates go from slower to faster to slower to um, kind of catch you on the beast and figure out. Okay, that's the next one. Okay, so here's where we're going to go. So I just showed you um, Canyonland Union District here. So here's the Colorado River and the Green River above their confluence. Here's Moab, Utah, Spanish Valley. Um, and Professor Valley, as you go upstream uh, towards Westwater Canyon and the Utah Colorado border. Um, so the you know, next. Thing. So the two main places I'm going to show you new data from are from this abandoned uh, green pond or abandoned bedrock land, which is Jackson Lake on right here. You can see every, right, everybody knows that there are these goose sniffing and trench meanders all through the system. Occasionally, one of them cuts itself off and gives us one of these up. Um, so I'll show you that first, and then um, um, Susan James did research right through the Spanish Valley and especially along the Middle Creek. Um, highlighted in white here are uh, salt grottles. These are uh, grottles uh, in the modern day landscape that are associated with salt in the subsurface. And, um, it has never really been known the rate, I don't know how active these are deployed today or what their rates are, so I'm going to tell you about that. Um, and then this is the King Springs Chemical that goes through the Potash area. Um, also, uh, um, an, an anticline that is not yet sort of breached and formed into a collapsed drop. And I'll have a slide about that. Okay, so let's go to this Jackson Ring And here's just a, an oblique Google Earth image. And, um, and so I mentioned you guys have been on river trips and hikes through things like this. The Colorado River flows right here now. This is the Potash Mine facility. And at one point in the past, it used to make a huge bend and it cut this now abandoned big portion of land. Um, at some point, it cut itself off here in the neck and is flowing through. And that leaves behind, right? These are all the gravels of the Colorado River um, that provide us a record of when this happened, what's happened since. Yes, All right, so here's looking straight down on that same ring line. There's that sort of heart shaped central peak in the middle of the ring line. And here's just a quick mapping of the ternary terraces um, in different shades of yellow. So, really quick, um, in the lightest shade of yellow are terraces that are relatively low down in the landscape and follow the river on its current pathway. And then as we go up, we get to the uh, orangey colors that are river gravels. Trapping the previous history uh, or path of the river around that thing. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim one, one thing that's neat about this is that right here I've got this T5, Paris number five gravel. That's interpreted um, actually as that, that is the bed of the Colorado River the day before it cut itself off and went straight. And so it is the abandoned channel of the river as it cut itself off. This T6 is actually a higher, slightly higher perched older tone that also is, you know, formed when the river was in that pattern. And then by the time you get to this T4, lower in the landscape, all the implication of the gravel and everything indicate, yes, it's now going the path that is now and cut itself off between T5 and T. Um, I also want to point out here's here's a here's the highest gravel in the study area that is perched 100 meters above the Colorado River. Um, downstream a little bit, and right on the right on the rim of the Big Springs uh, salt water pond down here. So I'm going to show you um, OSL dating results from these uh, T6, T5, and this T8 uh, to constrain the story. Okay. Oh, there's the path. So here's a little set of arrows for the way it goes on. Um, okay, well, so here. So this next photo um, is up here in the ring pond, looking at standing on this abandoned channel of the river and looking at this slightly higher only terrace um, and the exposure along the front there. Um, and so it's tough to see uh, from where you're at, but here's uh, there's a couple of students who are just watching me do. Um, and I'm looking for the same areas. Um, and actually it's the theme here of students taking pictures of me working. Um, so uh, here we're looking. This is that central view um, of the uh, of the ring pond, and this is the terrace that actually is older, right? There, the one I'm standing on, thinking, or somebody's standing on, making sure, 
taking this picture um, is the one that uh, was the bed of the river when it got made. And so uh, the OSL age from the sand limit here comes back at, at 165,000 years old. So pretty old river gravel perched in this old path here. All right, so the next picture though is, is on this T5, this main one that is the sort of snapshot of the river um, the day before it got eroded. One of, the, one of the cool things about this is uh, preserved in this T5 gravel, below my feet is gravel, but it has, because, because it got abandoned so quickly, and preserved in this wind pond, it still preserves this beautiful overbank sand and floodplain strategy. Um, so channel margin sand and floodplain that you don't often see preserved in the ancient record of terraces. And it's a really great target for West elevator. So literally the last flood waters that came through before the abandonment of this meander, we dated in two different locations. And the dates are almost perfectly um, replicable. At 128,000 years ago. So I would say 120,000 years ago, that was literally when the river cut itself off and abandoned this. That was like the day before the abandonment of the meander. And then the cool thing is, once once this meander gets bent, uh, bent um, uh, the local slopes uh, sediments can prograde out, right? As the, as the coastal sheet and you have local washes, they come out and they bury and preserve, help preserve some of this old river sediment. And so this reddish sediment above it is local slope wash that has come down and it would provide a minimum age of when the river abandoned, and that turns out really nice to um, be 124,000. <clears> so 128,000 years ago, this um, bedrock meander got cut off at its end and was abandoned. So that's pretty cool. To my knowledge, that's the first um, sort of history of one of these that's been worked on. All right, so the next slide is just downstream. Um, on that high gravel, it's noticeably higher um, in the landscape. Um, this is the sort of work you can do if you're on private land. Uh, and uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, me climbing down um, here and grabbing my gravel or salt sample. So this is the full thickness of this river gravel on this page. And, uh, and so from midway down this, you get um, an older OSL age, dating that the river was up here 100 meters above its current position. At about 185 dollars. Um, okay. Okay. So here's here's a plot that um, I hope makes sense to you. This uh, this, this is a diagram of different river terraces at different heights up above where the modern river is. Um, and then their age as you go back to time. Right, so this is just height above the modern Colorado River. And then you know in red here are the OSL ranges that I just told you about. And we're still working on one from this one. Uh, and uh, if you look at this trend through time of how has the river lowered um, and cut the canyon through time, this is when it was about to that rain pond. So this is before um, the abandonment of that rain pond, and then these are after. And so this trend line is really the slope on this plot. It says that since the abandonment of this bedrock meander, the river has eroded at a really steady rate. Of 300 meters per million years um, at this locality. And so I, re I really uh, love the idea that you know climate controls how terraces are made in rivers, and it's really really noisy. Right, the river will make a terrace for a long episode, and then it will size quickly. And you go through these cycles that are really noisy and confusing. And if you have a long enough record and enough geochronology, you can sort of average through all the noise and get the geologic rate that the river is in size. Um, and so here it's 300 meters per um, And then the cool thing here is that this highest gravel is only slightly older, even though it's much higher. Um, and if we believe that in essence state, it suggests that, that there was some time in the middle of the when in fact incision rates were very, very rapid. And then since the abandonment of this meander, incision rates are much lower. So then again, the slopes of these lines represent the rates of the of incision. Okay, so here's a here's a locality where the initial indications are that at some point a couple hundred thousand years ago, incision rates were really fast. And that since then they've slowed down to sort of a normal rate for the Colorado Plateau of 300 meters per hour. Yeah, yeah. So this this yeah, this will end up relating to where is the midpoint now and, and um, 
uh, where is that wave of decision that passed through this area 200,000 years ago, uh, but it's there normal. Okay. Um, yeah, no, and so, so here's the next slide. So this is stolen from papers and stuff. So Mo, and, and this, look at this map. This map, uh, Moab is right about here. And so this is Castle Valley and Professor Valley along the Colorado River as you go up towards Grand Valley. Right, or if you come down Dewey Bridge at Fisher Valley. Um, and so I had a student who studied up in this reach here, and he calculated incision rates like this using comparisons here near the mouth of Castle Creek, as well as up at Dewey, Dewey Canyon and Dewey Bridge. Um, and as you go upstream, right, so if Moab is here, then that ring pond that I just showed you like about here on the map, if you go upstream along the Colorado River and you calculate incision rates over the last 100,000 meters, you go from 300 meters per million years of the late time to 600 here um, underneath the Castle Creek Winery to really, really fast erosion. 900 meters per million years measured with terraces at Dewey Ridge. So here's a case where as you go upstream over tens of kilometers through the Colorado River system, the incision rate that you see in the late Pleistocene get faster and faster and faster as you go upstream. Right. So this is what I'm proposing now. If you think the thing again, then, then this would be down here at Jackson Wing Pond. There was rapid incision a couple hundred thousand years ago, but then recently it's a little bit slower and normal. If you go up here to the Pester Valley, Area. Um, we, actually, the terrace record doesn't go back far enough, but at least recently, there's a very, very rapid incision. Um, and then there is this mixed zone, which is Westwater Canyon. And the canyon is just upstream along the border. And then you get up in Grand Valley, and there's, uh, there's new uh, data from Grand Valley, not well published, but as far as we know, the incision rates up by Grand Junction are much slower than that. Would be. So, um, to my knowledge, this is kind of the first time along a trunk river where we were able to use terraces and sort of capture this pattern as we go upstream and downstream, consistent with the wave of incision going through the system in the Pleistocene. What do you guys think? Any questions? Very Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so Bob is bringing up the question of if you have this broad bullseye, there's a question of well, what would cause that pattern? You know, is, it, is it some kind of uplifting thing going on? And uh, and I guess I guess you know really I, I would say that uh, as you zoom in on that bullseye and you start to look at see stuff what's actually going on. Um, it becomes more complicated. Definitely. You get these waves of incision, and it's not. In fact, what it really does is it just changes the bullseye. The bullseye is too simple. Um, and uh, and uh, if you zoom in, you can see. Yeah, you can see where the stuff is hitting the fan in the river systems. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I think that's happening. Right, so yeah, it's just a kind of a broader scale working that happens. I mean, especially having yeah, I mean, a theory. If we're removing two or three kilometers of rock. In the plateau, just in the frame, it's inevitable that the isostatic event um, happens. Uh, what was your mid Pleistocene trigger? Do you have any speculation? Oh, well, yeah. Uh, no, so hold on. That's, 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 <laughs> the, point. that's the point of a slide uh, coming up. That's so, in Kenner um, Canyon is downstream with the bullseye lines, and so your model here would seem to indicate you should have low road rates. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we, if we yeah, and unfortunately I've done a couple of trips in Canada and there are no <laughs> There's yeah. nothing. There's no way I can measure the erosion. So, but yeah, yeah. But you, this would say that that downstream in Cataract Canyon in late Pleistocene time, the rates would be really modest, even less than like 300 meters. Which is still that's still really active erosion for the rest of the rest of the time. All right, we better move on to uh, to part three. Here. Um, so part three is ripped off uh, as, a, as a little bit of my graduate student, James Mock, who is uh, probably the best grad student I've ever had. Um, and uh, he, among other things, he was funded um, through EDMAP, through the EDMAP program, with a lot of help uh, by Grant and others in the room uh, to help make that. So he mapped 
um, this part. So this, this is Spanish Valley here, and I know you really can't see it, but uh, but the town of Moab is literally right here, and Helmut's Moab Club, um, you know, bust up a bit. Um, so he mapped Spanish Valley and then the, the valley is over here. Um, and we were trying to figure out the salt tectonics, so we just mapped the heck out of all these little faults. Um, but then also there are these nice river systems that we'll talk about that they go through this area and meet Colorado. Um, that provide us terraces so we can actually put weight and bank on the salt deposition in the Moab Spanish Valley group. So he's got a cross section from A to the economy, um, cutting right across um, this kind of a uh, proximal part of Spanish Valley. And so I copy and pasted part of that here um, just to sort of show generally, and if, if, I'm, sure, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, but there are several of these salt grabbing features in the Paradox Basin area. And one thing they have in common is that, in general, along the flanks or escarpments of the lava, you can see that the bedrock records what used to be an anticline in the landscape. Um, and so we have these broad salt anticlines that were all aligned with each other. But then something has happened since then to make them collapse down their axis and form these gravel. So the next one is uh, this is late last night, I just made an anticline. Okay, not too much. Um, <laughs> so originally we would come here and we would think these Jurassic rock up and over in an anticline. And uh, and and uh, and then I guess the other thing I want to point out here uh, that this mapping sort of caught me is that the pattern um, of what used to be an anticline now, if you look at the margin, um, these rocks are all rolling over and, and literally in some cases I think popped into this rock. In terms of what's going on structurally, here, you can see the dips of rocks. Instead of instead of literally sliding down into the gravel and rotating like that, they're all tilted into it and popping into this gravel. Um, and so that's sort of the neat pattern that is clear from this map. So here's a couple of big driving questions. So when we, we know that there are these anticlines, but then somehow they breach and, and now there's something coming up. When did that happen? Um, and, and, and why? And the existing hypothesis that is uh, common in the area, very few people have studied it, they've sort of made statements about it. Um, and Peter Huntoon is a champion of the idea that as you erode it, as the Colorado River system erodes this landscape, you start to unload places that are canyons. And that unloading of the rock like in Cataract Canyon um, allows salt to diaphoretically rise. And so there's definitely this picture in our minds, especially from downstream in the needle district of Canyonlands, that erosion can allow dietary uplift to itself. But that's for um, places along the Colorado River, places where there's dietaries, and you know, these salt gravel are something else, there's something else going on here. Um, and it's also um, Helmut and others, um, Carter back in the day, um, talked about there being a connection to the groundwater table. Um, removing salts in the subsurface and causing salt. So we're going to have like, that different process of uh, salt um, in this area. Okay. All right, so um, zooming in, this is rotating a little bit. Here's the Colorado River. Um, here's the uranium mine tailing site. So if you drive into Moab, right, you're going past the entrance to Archers, and you come around the Colorado River Bridge, and you go into the town of Moab. The town of Moab, right, is where Mill Creek and the Chiefs are used. And they join and go through the swamps to the portal where they join the Colorado River. And so a lot of you are familiar with this area, right? So you drive into downtown Moab, um, stock up on whatever you need to, and then you continue on to Spanish Valley. Um, and so we have Pack Creek starts up, and so there's Mill Creek on the plains of the La Salle. And um, I am not going to talk about Pack Creek because I know I won't have really enough time. And um, instead, if we just follow Mill Creek and see what the student James figured out, um, Mill Creek is neat because there's nicely preserved deposits way upstream here. And then as you go downstream, the two forks join and they cross the Hyatt and Hyatt salt ground at a right angle. So we can use the offset of these river terrace markers to calculate the rate at which this fault is swimming. It turns out to be a very active fault. Um, and then we're also going to follow that all the way to the Colorado River and talk about how rapidly Moab is subsiding. Um, so that's okay. Let's go back. So, right, so, so we're going to we're going to go up here first. Um, if you drive through Spanish Valley, you see there's a very beautiful high upland gravel that casts a mesa 
um, what we're going to call Johnson Ridge. So this next picture is looking downstream, looking to the west. And this is a tough one to see, but this is the south fork of Mill Creek as it heads off towards Moab. Moab is down here. And this is the grab of the Spanish Valley. And so between the south fork of Mill Creek and the Spanish Valley is this upland. And right on the green divide is this sweet big old river valley, uh, right on that divide. Um, so the rivers were up there, right? And that that tells us uh, this is a time before we had any incision of Mill Creek. And it turns out to be a time before any major subsidence of Spanish Valley. Right, so there are these normal faults here um, that break up in, in the path of the subsidence of Spanish Valley. One cool thing about these gravels is they're, they're annual gravels of Mill Creek, and they have bigger current indicators going this way. Um, and also, they, if you stand on top of this gravel, you can see that it coincides with an upland surface, especially to the south. Um, that forms this continuous thick apron of Pleistocene gravels um, preserved in the uplands around Moab. And so we interpret that as, a, as an old planation surface. I um, mean, it's really quite thick. Um, and it represents a period of time before all of this vertical incision and all of this subsidence back in the landscape. You guys will have to read James's thesis <laughs> to really believe everything I just said. But, uh, but so uh, the next picture, we're going to go right up here to this red star. And this is the place where we. Uh, gathered class and conducted a type of cosmogenic dating, um, isochron burial dating, where you look for quartz-rich class that are really deeply buried. So this is, uh, we, we gathered class two that were buried by 18 meters of gravel where you took the class. And uh, this method of burial dating tells us that this gravel um, has been buried for about 1.6 million years. The date's not quite done. Totally Results from one more car. Um, uh, to the south of Pack Creek, we also collected a second sample of the same upland deposit, and it came back to the same result. So one and a half million years ago, this landscape around Moab was was a blanket of uh, sort of upland gravels and a foundation surface. So here's one of these diagrams again, going through time, going back farther now. And down as we size the landscape and we have an elevation above Mill Creek today. So this high upland gravel and another one are way up here and they represent this big long period of middle place of time when there's very, very little erosion in the landscape. And instead you have tens of meters of gravel accumulating around on the sides. And then at some point, starting with the P5, at some point in the late place of time, all of a sudden, you start deciding vertically all these things. Um, and, and that, you know, it, it's this T7 that, that is also, uh, you know, up on the flank. And so we interpret that the faulting along the margin of the Spanish Valley also started at about this point. So, before 200,000 years ago, there was a middle Pleistocene period of prolonged stability in the landscape and stable base level. And then, a couple hundred thousand years ago, the shit is a thing. Um, and there's no other way to put it in Moab. And you started <laughs> ripping drainages and, and creating flock turns uh, through these tributaries. Uh, okay, next. And so that was up here. Um, with the dropping gravel. If we go down here towards the mouth, where it crosses the kind of fault line. Um, I want to show you these data um, that are pretty complicated. And I want to point out, in 2015, there was a paper published by Guerrero et al. Um, in the general lithosphere, where uh, among a couple of other places, they went to a strand of the Pianta Heights fault zone here. And they used radiocarbon dating, they did fault trench type studies in a gully. But it was a very, very recent record, right? So they were looking at faulting literally in the city limits of Moab. And in this one spot where they had a gully that was advantageous, they actually came up with a, with a rate of fault strength along a strand of this fault of three meters to a thousand meters. <coughs> right, so that's two or three times faster than the Wasatch Fault Zone. Um, most rapid faulting in Utah, um, if this were true. The problem is that their rate is from only the late Holocene in the last 2,000 years or so. Um, and so I'm interested in if we look over a longer record and get at the sort of background geologic rates um, outside of the noise, what is the rate of slip on the Saturn Fault? Okay. Okay, here's another uh, oblique view from Google Earth, and we're floating above the neighborhood in Moab, looking up Mill Creek, where there's a uh, urban trailhead, 
that goes into the sort of spot cleaning of the Mill Creek upstream. And so here's where Mill Creek comes down, crosses, especially this main mapped strand of the Tranquil Heights fault zone that Thomas Dolan puts on his map at Memorial Park. Um, all of these stars are places where we've dated these river gravel. And then when you cross the Tranquil Heights fault zone, rather than a canyon with river gravel, uh, marking incision, instead there's this bowling alley and a pile of gravel that you never see the bottom of. Right? There's just 16 years of gravel in a pile. Um, and so there's something happening across this fault, um, for sure. And I want to point out, we've got uh, the, the biggest uh, intensity of uh, uh, numeric ages we have are all from this mount area upstream of the fault. And so just upstream of the fault, um, over this past 200,000 years since incision has really of the seed. We can get, give you a really nicely populated air incision rate of 529 meters per million years, about half of half of the year per thousand years. So fast incision, just upstream of this fault, and then a pile of uh, gravel and bowling balls just upstream. Okay, okay, this is stolen from the Navy system. It's a very complicated diagram. It's one of my last ones. Um, so let's see if we can parse this out. Now here is the tributary mill creek as it comes down through the canyon ridge, through that incision ridge, right above the Tanker Heights Fault Zone. There's all these terraces of that age ago. And then it crosses the Tanker Heights Fault, and instead of a bunch of terraces in the canyon, we have remnants of basin salt. Right? So here at the mouth, it's gravelly basin salt. Um, and right behind that uh, bowling alley, uh, we've got three different numeric ages that range from 140,000 at the base to about 100,000 at the top, um, 100,000 years old. And that coincides, this T4 is dated to 110,000 years old. Right, so, as the river crosses here, we've got a dating here that's about 100,000 years old, and we've got a service travel there that's 100,000 years old. So, there's been this much offset on the kind of high fault zone that's exposed um, right here, and that gives us of 439 meters per million meters on the exposed part of the Kansas Heights Fault Zone. The other thing, the, the other students who I haven't stolen figures from yet is mapped um, elsewhere in Moab, and there, there are, you know, we, we think there are other strains. This Kansas Heights Fault Zone is, is wide, and then other strands of the fault zone that are in the subsurface. And we also see the basin fill exposed <coughs> in the town of Moab, and it appears to be warped and dead down into the basin and inside it. So now, things are really dropping here, and not all of the motion is just on the exposed part of the Tanta Heights Fault Zone. So as we continue through downtown Moab and across Minnesota, um, we eventually will make it out to the swamps towards the Colorado River before it punches through and uh, goes downstream. And we know from uh, uh, Helmut's work and other work actually inspired by the Iranian mine field that, um, that Wells and other evidence indicate that there's a good hundred meters of river gravels beneath the Colorado River out here. Well, that's a way. Um, so yeah, at least a hundred meters of gravel um, at this scale, and so that that's a hole that's been deciding and accumulating gravels from tributaries in the base there. Um, so we've got rapid incision up here, and we've got even more rapid substance here. And when you put those together, you buy um, a lot of tectonic activity going on, a lot of salt going on. So yeah, the, the, this is a maximum, and we don't know the age of these gravels. We're just totally guessing that maybe maybe this T5, what is Susan really <laughs> today, maybe those gravels are about the age of the gravels at the bottom of this part. But if that was true, it would give us a maximum substance rate of a kilometer per kilometer um, underneath Mars. So in the title, I said Moab is sinking. Moab is sinking at about a meter per thousand meters. Um, and that is actually even faster, that's twice as fast as the slot canyons are eroding upstream of Moab. And that's fast. So, um, okay, what's the, what's the next Okay, so this is uh, this is a uh, final summary slide of uh, this sort of geometric picture. Um, and so it, uh, it's the same diagram of following Mill Creek down through the canyon. Um, crossing the kind of ice fault down into this basin film, which is warped down into the subsurface um, underneath the Moab Valley. Um, and then the Colorado River 
you know, controlling bait level continues downstream in practical canyon. So uh, one kind of cool thing is that as the Colorado River in size, this is where base level control can be used. One thing that's neat is that uh, the rate of incision along the Colorado River and the rate of incision up here across the Robin and the tributaries are really similar, right? Incision is really fast. So uh, as the Colorado River drops, that incision signal is propagating upstream into Mill Creek, um, really nicely. And you can see it hits the midpoint, midpoint, and eventually the midpoint point until you have these upper gravels still preserved in the landscape. Um, and you can take that up in gravel and you can, your, you can do that in your profile and you can sort of see how much substance has there been in Moab Valley um, since those up in gravel. So this is kind of a confusing thing. There's, there's river incision in the landscape up here, but then in the gravel, um, there's actually been a huge amount of substance because the, the, the total amount of substance is accommodated partly by the river gravel. And also by the gravel accumulation for a greater piece. So uh, I showed you a, about a thousand meters per million year of, uh, of this substance below the river. But then, you know, the true substance in the landscape relative to the geo, you have to add on the total base level falling incision of the river also for the next one. So this is a part of the world that is documented out there. And I guess uh, uh, the last point here is that. Um, the, uh, the sort of hypothesis that's never really been explored or studied or or uh, or uh, confirmed is this groundwater connection. So how can you do? How, how can you have a Colorado River cut down, and how can you have this basin drop faster than the Colorado River is in size? And the Colorado River is in size because this basin is dropping even faster, um, making this whole gravel system. And there must be this groundwater connection, I and mean, there are folks. Done studies of groundwater in Mount uh, by now. So, as the Colorado River drops, it is the control for the regional aquifer, right, and the, and the groundwater table in Mount Down. So, if it drops 500 meters, the groundwater table drops 30. And as the groundwater table drops, hypothetically, that allows near surface groundwater flowing along um, the valley to encounter parts of the paradox that are not just a bunch of tough to dissolve. Right, so the, you see paradox around Moab, but it's this fine, you know, gypsum stuff. It's not really involved. So as the river incises, the groundwater table follows it. It encounters fresh salt of the paradox, dissolves it through the groundwater system. The river removes it, and the valley is collapsing faster than the river is incising. Um, and this hole is being made by groundwater removal of salt, and that is all hypothetical. <laughs> but this is the first study that actually says, well, yeah, this really makes sense. And when we talk about rates, and it seems like this has to be going on. And we can't think of an alternate hypothesis for why that value would be simply so fast, faster than the All right. Are we done? Just, some, just a quick take on point. Uh, and so, uh, yep, the central plateau is eroding like crazy in the Pleistocene. And it looks like that uh, the erosion is marked by um, mix zones and waves of incision going upstream through the river systems. And uh, the youngest wave of incision on the Powell River passed Moab about 200,000 years ago. And it dropped based on about 200 meters. These are things we can put numbers on that. Um, and uh, it's up maybe in Westwater Canyon now. Um, and before that time, there was this long period of middle crisis and sort of quiescence in the landscape for some reason. Um, and then um, one of the astute um, folks in the audience asked this question before. Um, this is why, you know, what, why would, if the Colorado River drops base level to Grand Canyon 60 million years ago, why would that result in, there's no really good reason why that would result in many different little waves of incision. And so the question is, well, what, this sort of implies that, that in southeastern Utah, there's a distinct middle late Pleistocene base level fall that has happened, that has helped cut cataract canyon, and that we see in the landscape around Moab. So what would be the source of that? Why would you get this pulse of really useful based on the fall? And the answer is, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's how science progresses, right? It's like, well, why would this happen? What is causing it? Um, so here's a couple things on the point. The town of Moab is sinking at about a meter per thousand meters. Um, and uh, the exposed part, uh, not all of it, of the plant, I felt building is looking at 
um, about 45 uh, centimeters per thousand meters. Um, and uh, so that's, that's why these rates remind me of the east cache faults up in the cache valley. And these are faults in places that are deforming as fast as the east cache valley is um, along the Wasatch Front. Maybe not as fast as some of the places we thought. Um, so finally, um, um, and I didn't give you all the lines of evidence for this, but it seems like uh, substance decline has tracked incision decline in the river system. Um, but that substance in Moab exceeds the rate of incision. And that all seems to be consistent with the only hypothesis I can do that. And that is kind of confirming that incision drives cell photonics, not necessarily always through unloading and uplifting salt, but also by dropping the groundwater table and removing salt through dissolution, forming these slabs drop. Um, so that all supports that hypothesis. All right, and then some of you know, um, we'll be leading a friend of the Constitution. Um, to all of these sites in October. And I know some of you guys are coming, but the rest of you are invited on a rowdy and crazy Friends of the Nice to Center in October um, if you want to see some of this. Thanks for letting me take up all your time. <laughs> Um, so in uh, in Moab Valley, um, there are uh, well, no, in both Spanish Valley and Moab Valley, if you think of them as two separate valleys, um, we are frankly using the published UGS um, water groundwater survey from just a few years ago. Right? There's some sweet maps in the back of that that are sort of isopack maps that basically fill that. So to some degree, we're using that. Also, James did um, try to plumb water well records himself. Um, and then a few little published items around the beginning of 19. But, but the answer is well. Um, mostly in this, the seismic data that exists or the gravity data, which we looked into, is much too vague for this area to be all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, just curious if are you thinking or has there been any integration of the Dolores and the Paradox Valley in your work? Oh, yeah, no, no, no. I, yeah, those are beautiful. Um, collapsed anticline back at the end. And um, no, nope, that's a great idea. Yep, I, uh, um, uh, well, I guess I've driven through those valleys. And uh, and um, I haven't seen the kind of nice suite of terraces we would need to get stuff at this time scale as much. But, but, uh, but that's, that's the point. If you, if you, as the Dolores River cuts a couple of other of these nice salt problem, uh, it is another place where you could do this sort of stuff. And nobody in the family. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's true. Uh, between Price and Green River, um, there are beautiful Pleistocene gravels that you see preserved coming off of the Hook Cliffs and headed towards the Price River. So uh, yeah, and in fact, uh, I have a grad student. My current grad student is working on this for us along the book course. Um, so we're doing the same sort of thing there, but there's no salt pickles um, in that case. But yeah, but, but, but the quick story is that um, there are a lot of familiar middle late Pleistocene ages for these gravel all around the Colorado Plateau. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, the point is um, as uh, climate change changes the ultimate base level of sea level, um, is there any chance that those could propagate up um, and get the fossils? I guess uh, um, the, uh, the studies that have been done, especially on the Mississippi River, where they're able to, uh, where they've studied the heck out of it, they track how far it's been, and also, you yeah, uh, studies that have tracked how far upstream from the sea do you see that high base level effect from sea level change? Um, the answer is that usually there's not enough time between glacial cycles for those base level signals to affect rivers more than a few hundred times. So pretty far. But we are so far upstream 
is so much higher that uh, it, would be, it would be illogical to see that one. But if you go down, I mean, if you go down to Yuma, Arizona, the deposits there are all about sea level. So yeah, yeah, so granted that is asking whether those those uh, normal faults um, along through Moab and along the Robin are tectonic or salt. And, and I guess uh, I suppose that they're absolutely I mean they are a salt dissolution tectonic issue. Um, in the sense that uh, I mean there's all this evidence for for subsequent and these really rapid rates that cannot be accounted for by far fewer stresses. I think it's not like this part of the world um, right? So we, we we know that it isn't and so it, it has something to do with this localized salt. And then I mean I think that the thing that we see over and over again um, in the map in this area with James and along these faults, at least in this study areas, is that uh, you know, there are some kind of ancestral Moab fault faults that look like normal, normal faults. But um, but much of the Pleistocene faulting really, to me as a general geologist, looks more like uh, often when you see things expanding, not flooding the vast each other. So things are expanding and talking and into that base. Um, and so, yeah, so to me that's consistent with literally, yeah, you just create an avoid in the valley and things are falling. Uh, rather than um, a click print kind of. So yeah, so so I, I think this is neat. I mean, this is sort of falling beneath the radar of these really rapid rates of faulting around Moab and, and, and deformation. Uh, but it is true, right? There's no reason there's no reason to expect that these are really size of um, you know, in the way that, for example, the Washington Shoulder is is size of uh, so even though uh, we're just starting to, to get at the rates of slip, and there are hazards in Moab, we wouldn't expect to pay very much for the here in Solid Flip. Um, and that's not going to upset from, I think, um, the community. I guess, um, I guess I've got one point. We just wait how fault and like it's slipping. Now one thing, when we calculate the rate of slip of that fault over a longer time period, over 200,000 years, the rate is one sixth this half of that Guerrero people. And so there's the Guerrero people that had this alarming slip rate in the town of Maya um, from the whole school. And when we look over along the record, it, it is significantly short. And it's short term really fast. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's a cool question. The question was, uh, if you weren't able to hear it over there, the question was, uh, as, as people uh, change and increase groundwater withdrawal from this area, um, would that affect that feedback? Oh, yeah. I don't know. Well, I mean, I guess it, it does you know, remind me, uh, there, there, uh, there's been a hypothesis, but I guess it's still being tested in the needle salt and just down to where um, perturbing changes in climate and the input of water over sort of molecular time scales to the subsurface um, it drives cycle for tension in the salt. So when it's wetter in the Pleistocene, um, you have more groundwater getting to that salt and using it up. And they were greater stick, very racial. And then in the whole system, it's actually so fun. They really dry up. Um, and 
Yeah, that's a neat hypothesis, but, but it's a piece of paper that is still a customer. So that reminds me of like, how far that ground down the if anything, the more water you can show the more good condition. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, I, I guess. Um, yeah, so that's intriguing to me. As you as you look as you walk upstream in the Colorado River system, I'm suggesting that as you get to west water and then canyons upstream, that's where um, you can see a wave of inclusion hitting right now. And and all the patterns of erosion that we can see so far suggest that as you go up the Green River, you say, um, that desolation point is a transient system. And it is true that uh, the incision rates right below the so in Green River, really Jack measure, um, are really rapid. And um, and then all the indications are that as you go to the head of desolation tender, the Pleistocene incision rates are very slow. So that's the signature of desolation canyon is a mix zone that is this wave of incision hitting like that. I think it's also not Oh, yes. 